Welcome to LCS Talks. I'm Berkeley Glazer, and I'm the principal of Langley Christian Middle School. Today on the panel, we have Kevin Merchandani. He's our director of uh, instruction uh, for our school. We have Dave McVitie, who is our therapeutic counselor. We have Eric Bailinga, who is our director of information and technology. And we have Lauren Enns, who is a youth care worker at the middle high school. So welcome, panel, and Kevin's going to take it away. We are discussing today social-emotional learning and trying to better understand how our tech is forming us, its role, what it's doing to shape us into a Christian community, and how to intentionally think about what we're going to do with it. And so we go back to our key passage, John 10, looking at this idea of abundant life and trying to realize more and more of what abundant life looks like in our community. So um, just to take us back a little bit to our technology guiding principles that we introduced in our first talk, I'll read them for you here. We've got filling, filling versus emptying. We've got wisdom versus law, discernment versus mindless acceptance, innovation and imagination versus indifference, accountability versus surveillance, dialogue versus debate. And what we'll be talking about today is uh, some of these principles and how they're lived out, not only in our school community, but also in our households. And so I, I'm going to turn this over to our panel here. Dave, why don't you talk to us about our first principle on there, this idea of filling versus emptying. What does that look like in terms of technology usage? Uh, I'm going to kind of refer you back to episode two, where we, th we sat with Matthew Price and, and um, some of the things that stood out to me from that session related to this was uh, kind of the image that came to mind was if if you're living an abundant life and, and technology and your use of technology leads you to include more people, be more engaged in the world around you to offer Jesus to more people, then that is uh, kind of the image I had was kind of a funnel cloud. And at the top is when it's healthy and good and you're kind of absorbing more of the world around you. And if technology drives the opposite way all the way down to the tiny bit at the bottom of that funnel cloud, then it's secluding you from life. Then it's limiting your interactions with the world around you and kind of an indicator of whether it's good or bad, whether you're off balance or in balance. And we can help, maybe even with that image, uh, teach our kids and even reflect for ourselves whether or not our use of technology is actually benefiting us and creating that abundant life that we talked about. Is this fulfilling, whole, communal, or is it isolating uh, and secluding us from the world around us? Yeah, the image that comes to mind there is this garden or this oasis versus this desert. And what I, th I think about is, is it filling us up and, and making us more like Christ? Are our conversations actually shaping us? And, and technology does have a really important role to play in that. So Dave, maybe you could walk us through um, a second one here. Um, let's compare wisdom versus law. What does that look like? Well, when I think of, of, of wisdom and law, I think of... Um, kind of how we respond to the world around us when there's rules and law. We don't always like that. We usually respond kind of poorly. Um, and when we think of kids, if we just drop a law, a rule, without their understanding, they're always asking why, right? Kind of sometimes annoyingly so. A lot of whys. And you can explain it till you're blue in the face, and still the whys aren't enough often for kids. We want to teach them wisdom, not just obey and not just don't and do. We want to teach them to to discern and to process things. And so for, for wisdom, when it comes to us as uh, educators, but also you as parents, um, the, the phrase or whatever, the catchphrase that I tend to use is this, this rules without relationship mm -hmm. equals rebellion. If you want your kids to rebel, drop a bunch of rules and don't get to know who they are. Mm -hmm. So take a minute. And think about the last time you rebelled and ask yourself if you had a relationship with that person or not. Likely you didn't like them in that moment. The person you were rebelling against was all about rules and made you feel isolated and like you either weren't known or didn't matter as who you were. They just cared about the law. And so when it comes to our kids or students that we're walking with, we want to know them. We want to engage with them. We want them to, to some degree at least, know us. Uh, as compared to just dropping rules. Now, that doesn't mean that we drop the rules uh, and don't have any, but they need to know that we're loved, so they trust the boundaries. 
um, and they accept them as much as they're able. They might be frustrated and angry and they might not agree, but if you love them, then the hurt or the frustration, the draw to rebel dissipates because they know they're cared for and who they are matters. Yeah, Dave, that that idea of acceptance is a big point of conversation here. And uh, Lauren, why don't you walk us through this whole idea of discernment versus mindless acceptance? Yeah, for sure. Um, When I think of discernment, I think of your role as the adult and how your kids, their kids, they don't necessarily know what they they need. They know what they want. They want to spend more time on social media, but of course they do. That's why, that's what social media is designed to do, to draw them in. But as the adult, it's your role to figure out what does your child actually need? Um, you think of boundaries, it's important for kids to have boundaries and it's your role to discern what kind of boundaries they need. Um, Even though they may want to be online all the time after school because that's where their friends are, that's actually not what they need right now. They need a break from school because they have that all day, every day. They don't need it after school as well. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Now to build on that here, we have this idea of innovation and imagination versus indifference. That idea of indifference definitely connects a lot with mindless acceptance. We can be passive or we can actively and intentionally think about what this, the presence of technology will look like in our households. Maybe walk us through what those principles look like. Totally. Um, when you think of indifference, it's just going with what's already there. It's the easy thing to do because no extra thought has to be put into it. Um, innovation, imagination, that takes work to think outside the box, but you don't want to settle for a cheap form of connection for your kids. And sometimes social media can be that if that's all they have. It's just Um, it's a cheap form. It's not a true connection with the people around them or the people in their lives. And so helping your child figure out ways to connect with people in a real way, in a creative way that isn't just screen to screen, but face to face and using social media to connect them in that way. And then going from there and having that real connection. Thanks, Lauren. And we've got accountability versus surveillance. Eric, give us some guidance on what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, really, that comes back to, I think, the wisdom and law conversation that Dave was talking about. Um, when we're talking about surveillance, that's often the quick, cheap fix to sort of control what our kids are doing. And I mean, certainly that's one tool in our tool belt. We need to, to know what our kids are up to and to, to keep them accountable. And that's, that's the main thing. We need to have accountability, which involves relationship. So while there are tools to help you know, uh, blockers and filters and that sort of stuff uh, to help filter out the bad stuff. That's, that should never be the first line uh, of defense. The first line of defense is that relationship. And that's, that's the accountability right there. We need to be building relationships with our children. So we know what they're doing. We know what they're going to be encountering on a day-to-day basis. That is, that's the single best thing you can do for your kids. Thanks, Eric. And our, our last principle here is dialogue versus debate. And, And when I think of dialogue, I think of what it means to keep the conversation going. And the priority here in a dialogue versus a debate is on learning how to think about coming to your beliefs and and drawing conclusions, as opposed to simply getting to the conclusion, which is debate. And I, I think this is really important as we engage with our families and we think about how to shape our, our children in terms of how they think about technology, its role, how it's shaping who they are. And part of that, I think, is um, what we do in our conversations to set up opportunities to learn, to experiment, to, to see, is this actually working for us? What are some of the, the limitations that are being imposed when we introduce things like cell phone or cell phone usage time? Or um, should we have uh, our children on data plans? Um, do they get their own laptop? Do they get to use it um, at their own discretion? And, and I think facilitating how to think about these things is a really important place where we want to put our energy and efforts as a school community to help students think about what they'll do and to um, take responsibility and ownership of this important um, piece of technology. And so um, let's uh, let's kind of shift gears a little bit here to look and uh, think theologically and biblically. What are some of the key passages that guide us for how we engage with social media? Social media has a really key role in our uh, students' lives, much of the time that we spend on social media does form us. And so, um, Lauren, why don't you talk us through um, this idea of a body image and um, help us to understand the the role that social media is playing. What are some of the key scriptural passages that um, we can look at and how should we think about helping our, um, our children navigate the world of social media, their body image, and how to do that well? For sure. Um, 
When you think about the impact that social media is having on our middle schoolers at this age or high schoolers, their idea of self, and that's forming right now. Everything but who they are, who they're becoming, who they want to be, that's all in the works. And so when they are constantly bombarded with social media, that's what's going to begin forming their sense of self. Um, and if you think of Psalm 139, it says we are formed in our mother's womb, like God knit us together. And that was done with purpose and intention, and he created us the way we are. And if we're hearing that um, message versus the message of social media, which can often just be, you need to change, you need to be better, you need to be different. Um, whichever route we take is drastically different from what our view of self becomes. And so for me, even I'm in my early 20s and I'm off social media right now because I try to put truth in, in my head and um, I'm in the word and I want to know what the Lord thinks about me. But to constantly have that message of who everyone else is saying I, I am and it to be a pretty distorted view, I realize that's not healthy for me. And so I've taken a step back. And so um, for our middle schoolers, especially in our high schoolers, I think it'd be wise to have limits on that because they don't necessarily see what it's how it's impacting them or the distorted view of themselves that it's giving them. Yeah, totally, Lauren. Yeah, I know for myself, even as an adult, it's incredibly hard to keep myself controlled. I can't imagine what it is like for a forming mind to have to navigate those conversations. Dave, um, can you talk about addiction? Like this stuff can't possibly be addictive, can it? <laughs> Come on. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> Uh, social media, all of it is so addictive. The fact that you can scroll and see a new image or a new video and quick, like TikTok is a nightmare. <laughs> You'll spend hours on there by accident <laughs> and not even realize where the time's gone. Um, but it's just the way that our brain works, that the images and the, the light, the pixels, everything that comes to our mind. Um, and I, I think on a biblical note, though, the the kind of the parable that strikes me is the the parable of uh, the talents, where he gives you know the money to these three guys and they're supposed to do mm-hmm. something faithful with it. And mm-hmm. so, um, internet, social media, all of this is to be redeemed and used for good. Um, and so, keeping that in mind as we discern, as we process, as we teach, as we look at ourselves in the mirror, knowing that our kids magnify whatever we do, is super important. Because we're going to find ourselves addicted, uh, drawn to feeling naked without our phone, going and checking. You're stopped at a stoplight and you want to check your phone. Like, don't. <laughs> You're going to get a ticket. But that's how intuitive it is for us. And these forming minds, it's super, super addictive. They're going to come back to it, get their validation through it. How many likes, how many views mm-hmm. becomes rooted in who they are and, and they get depressed if they don't have that, how is that not addictive? It's an overt form of validation. Someone saying, I like you. How often do you hear that in your day to day? But we long for that validation. And mm-hmm. so of course it's addictive. And it also applies to other elements of addiction as well. Pornography, for example, is uh, a nightmare addiction online. Kids' minds are not formed or developed. They don't have that part of their brain of cause and effect developed until their early 20s and here they are trying to discern their brain doesn't they may know logically that if I do this there's a negative consequence but they can't actually process what that means so they're not able to say no so we need the filters Um, otherwise they fall into this deep biologically rooted addiction their brain and their chemistry all become addicted to these things same applies for us Hopefully, we just lived a little bit longer without technology before we were introduced to it. Mm. Uh, And so we have it better the older we are, Mm. less addictive for us than it will be for them. So if I could ask a a provocative question then, is social media even a good thing for our teens to have? Is there something that can be redeemed in social media? Well, it's a good question. Um, your best intentions can be there. I've heard of kids using it for evangelism, for interaction, for uh, expressions of creativity. My um, 11th grader right now is starting to develop his own little YouTube channel and stuff where he's customizing Funko Pops. It's art, basically, and he's doing all these things. And he's actually pouring his creativity into an, a venue uh, that others can notice, which, again, if he relies on the likes, it's negative. Um, but it's also an expression of creativity where he doesn't need a museum to show off his work or whatever, that he actually has a venue to 
have people appreciate what he's creating. So um, there are things that we can redeem. Personally, I don't see much of a need for middle schoolers to have any social media, particularly, and even all through high school, communication is one thing, mm-hmm. right? So if we're talking about Facebook Messenger, I'm, that's not the same thing as scrolling Facebook feeds. Mm-hmm. So we have to differentiate this, I think. Uh, we need to learn to communicate and good, be good digital citizens online, um, but communication is not the same as free reign mm-hmm. to scroll. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm hard-pressed to find any real good rationale behind why we would have social media like that to scroll. Yeah, you're asking some big questions, Dave, about identity formation. What are the questions that we should be asking in terms of uh, engaging with our children? And then we'll, we're going to get to an example here. And I, I just want to uh, throw a, a heads up to our listeners here that Eric will be talking about internet safety at some later point. We're um, going to find some time to pick his brains a little bit on what do we do when we want to introduce some healthy parameters in our families and encourage that identity formation and and think about how we can do that cooperatively with our children. But Dave, let's go back to some of these questions. What should we be asking ourselves as we reflect on um, these guiding principles so far and think about how to introduce a kind of lens for how we engage with technology in our households? Uh, Well, these conversations are going to be tricky. They're not really any different because how many times did you go to your parents and say, my friend has this, everybody has this, I want one too. But it seems so much heavier now, right? Right. I want a phone. I need this. I need data. And we actually, as parents, begin to believe that. Just the conversation yesterday in the staff room, one of the teachers talking about how they are thinking about getting their seventh grader a phone because we don't have a landline anymore. And when the Mm -hmm. parents leave the house, the kids aren't safe or get a landline. (laughs) So uh, it's true, right? We'd we'd have to think about these things differently. Um, But in order to have these conversations, first of all, if at all possible, don't be afraid of them. You're going to want to avoid them and just drop a hammer and say no, because it's way easier and less uncomfortable. But it creates that rebellion streak, right? And that pushback. And so you're going to want to engage with them at their level. So emotion coaching is uh, this this tool that um, I recommend and walk people through where you engage with what is the root emotion? They feel left out. Okay, I don't blame you for wanting a phone because you must really feel left out. And because you see everyone else around you, it looks like they all have it. And because you want to be included. Remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be included. I wanted, what the heck is Saturday Night Live? Mm -hmm. Why am I not allowed to stay up and watch this thing? (laughs) And I didn't know what it was, but they were all joking about Wayne's World, (laughs) dating myself. Anyway... Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so what did my dad do? He got his secretary to VHS record it for me so she could bring it home and I was still going to bed on time. Anyway, not the point so much as we want to be included. So I don't blame you for wanting a phone because you want to know, you, you don't want to be left out mm-hmm. of either the conversations or the social kind of the what's cool and engage with them on what they're feeling. Let them know what makes sense that they're asking and wondering about these things. Um, that doesn't mean you have to give an answer. Avoid the word but if at all possible. Mm-hmm. If you are tempted to use the but, then slow yourself down and make sure you've done at least three becauses, which means it makes sense because. And then shift into, okay, what what are we going to do about this together? And how do we navigate this together? And if you know their heart then you fostered that relationship, they're more likely to receive the rule that you say, this is our family rule or standard or what we agree to. So listening to them, hearing their hearts, hearing the whys behind the story of what they're asking for, validating is the biggest piece, letting them know it makes sense and why it makes sense. That's a super helpful example, Dave. What? Uh, let's throw maybe another one out here. This might be a little bit uh, more challenging. You're you're noticing your kids waking up um, pretty late, having a hard time getting to school on time. They've got their phone in their room. They're probably using their their laptop. Sometimes it's I've got to stay up really late and do some homework. 
how do you approach that conversation with them about their their device usage, but also things like their mental health, their well-being? How do you do that in an effective way? Well, uh, it's a good question. Every human is different. So I can give you general guidelines, but in the end, you're going to have to sit with your child and have an, a conversation with them. Mm-hmm. i got four kids. They're all different. And I have to navigate a conversation with each one differently. Um, so I would start with questions. Hey, I've noticed mm. that you're having a hard time getting up. How are you feeling about that? Is that okay? What's going on for you? Do you feel really groggy in the morning? Are you feeling awake and alive during the day? Oh, what's... And a lot of questions and inquiry and inviting answers. Uh, Inevitably, though, if you slow down enough and are willing to have the patience and take the time, they're going to back themselves into a corner, Hmm. right? Well, And first of all, if at all possible, avoid devices in the bedroom. Have them charged outside of the bedroom. Have homework be done outside of the bedroom if possible. I recognize uh, that's not always possible. Or you've let it slide so long and didn't do this in the first place that it's just the norm. So there's other situations, but um, helping them navigate using their time wisely. Okay, why are we up till three in the morning to do homework? We should probably be budgeting time toward that homework in advance. Mm. Um, And the earlier you teach them these things, the less likely it is to hit in high school at such um, a drastic level. That said, um, doing things like shutting the internet off at a certain time of night and making that kind of the standard when they're young enough so that they don't lose it at 15 when you suddenly have a time limit on things and they Mm. waited till midnight to do their homework. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's trickier and harder to navigate that. Not that it's too late, but in some ways it is. Um, So conversations about how it's not healthy for you, how it impacts you, how you've noticed you don't sleep well, You can reference science a little bit if you want. You need to be away from screens a full hour before bed or your brain doesn't settle and you can't sleep. This is just fact. And so you're not sleeping well, are you? Um, Are you being intentional about staying off a screen an hour before bed? Hey, what's your target bedtime? You know, these kind of questions uh, should be kind of a little bit commonplace in your house. Notice what it's doing to you. Share it with them. That kind of thing. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. That's great. So for both of you, uh, how do we seek Christ more and live wisely with how we support adolescents with tech use? I mean, one way that Jesus was showing us how to do things was just by example. And so I think when parents can lead by example and their tech use represents what you want to see in the household, that is a huge step for how your kids are going to learn. Because if you're telling them that too much tech isn't good, but you're on your phone all the time and not giving them the attention that they need and um, the connection that they're longing for, then why, why, would, they, why would they hear that? Why would they listen? Mm-hmm. And ask them. <laughs> The probability is you think you're doing okay online. They don't see it that way. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) And drop your guard to go, okay, wait a minute. This is their perception. Instead of arguing with them, I need to accept that maybe I'm out of balance in their eyes. And actually what they see matters more than how I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, this has been a really good conversation with you both, Dave and Lauren. And we're just really excited to see how some of these ideas and, and Eric too, Lauren is pointing out, um, of oh, course. Thanks. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we've uh, really enjoyed thinking about what it means to sit down together as family, to ask the questions, to empathize, to work together cooperatively to think about the role of technology and putting it in its rightful place and making sense of how technology is shaping our identity is a key conversation to be had as a family. And so, yeah, we look forward to more conversations that we will be having about these guiding principles. We'll be unpacking them further. Looking forward to another conversation with Eric, who we really appreciate with the work that he's doing at our school with IT. And um, yeah, we look forward to sharing more in upcoming episodes. All right. 